Sharon and I got married in the spring of 2016. It was one of the happiest moments in my life. A few days later, I started thinking seriously about killing myself. Thinking about driving into one of these trees. I had little idea why I felt this way. I wondered if I was losing my mind. I had been writing a biography of my famous father, Paul Weidlinger, and I had just gotten to the point in his story where I am born and enter into his life. What had been an objective tale about a famous man became personal. Suddenly, I was writing about my father and me, my mother and my sister. I thought it would be easy to finish the book and make this film, but to do so, I had to bring all of them back to life in my mind. I had to get close to them without succumbing to the evil that had threatened to engulf us all. My earliest memory is of going to our summer house, which I loved. My father designed it the year I was born. To go in, we went up the ramp. Inside, it felt like we were sailing through the pines. The swinging door to the kitchen made me think of a cowboy saloon. I loved the sound. My mother didn't. My father just came on weekends. He showed me how to make drip sand castles. Out in the world, Paul Weidlinger was a very famous structural engineer. He collaborated with the most creative architects of the 20th century. I didn't really know him. I observed he ate his English muffin dry without butter or jam. He drank his coffee black. And each day he read every page of the newspaper. By the time I was grown up, we had lost the house. Abandoned, it became a ruin on National Park land. Then some people decided to restore it as an architectural landmark. I volunteered on the work crew. The experience made me curious to know more about Paul Weidlinger, my father. Many years before, I had interviewed him about his life, but he mostly just repeated familiar stories, I which said, okay, I didn't really believe. Limit. That's all you can get. Uh, amazing. This was America. 
I got this fantastic salary of $40 a week. I thought I was a billionaire. And then we rented this apartment. He told me he had taught himself to read at four. He was a communist at 14. At 18, he was arrested and sentenced to death. He eloped with my mother to Bolivia. Later, she developed schizophrenia. He started a world-renowned company just so he'd have enough money to pay her hospital bills. He was friends with Herman Kahn, the nuclear war planner who inspired the insane movie character of Dr. Strangelove. He said he helped protect the world from Armageddon. When he died, I received a box of his papers. I opened it and discovered that most of his fantastic stories were true. The one significant fact that he never told me, the fact I would discover elsewhere, was that we are Jews. I had no idea how this affected the fate of our family across four generations. I learned as I uncovered our story. Il était un petit navire, il était un petit navire qui n'avait ja, ja, jamais navigué, qui n'avait ja, ja, jamais navigué. Oui, oh, oui. My mother oh, used to sing this song to me as she matelot, rocked me to sleep. Long before I was born, she would sing it to my father. Mon cher petit matelot, my dear little sailor, I would give up the sun for a whole week just to feel you near me, to have your head on my shoulder, even if it were only for a few minutes. You know, sometimes the blood suddenly stops flowing in my veins when I think about how long we have to be apart. Look at me. Do you see? I love you so much. Prepare a little nest for me with your arms, where I can feel very happy once again. Your little boat. Paul was also deeply loved by his own mother. He remembers Yulia smiling at him with her round face and red hair. She was very beautiful. She died when he was four years old. It was the flu epidemic of 1918. Afterwards, he remembers being in hiding with his father, Andor, during Hungary's bloody counter-revolution when communists and Jews were hunted in their homes. After a while, life returned to normal. Andor remarried and prospered as a building contractor in Budapest. Many of his apartment buildings still stand. But for Paul, his father's new wife could not replace the mother he had lost. As a boy, his closest relationship was with his aunt Ely, who was just three years older. I was proud to be his aunt. He was a smart, impetuous boy. He hated that his father made him take fencing lessons. He hated kissing ladies' hands. He had the traits of an anarchist. 
On weekends, they would take the tram through the forest to the last stop near St. John's Mountain. He plagued me with the big questions of the world, which in his opinion should be blown up. He wanted to break out of his father's rigid plans for him. We played wild games together. We discussed the question of suicide and agreed that it is acceptable in ethical terms. As teenagers, Paul and Ely started going to underground communist meetings. I read Marx and Engels in German. I thought this was the absolute truth about everything. And it opened my horizon. I came from an upper middle class family and all of a sudden, I heard about the poor and the working class. We wrote a petition protesting the execution of two revolutionaries, and we went house to house collecting signatures. It was the first time I saw those people. They existed. He told me the most dangerous thing that they did was to write and publish an illegal newspaper called The Red Student. We got arrested, the whole of us, one afternoon. So when I was in there, they told me I'm going to be executed. And I had always been skeptical about this story. It seemed too incredible. But my cousins in Hungary, the grandchildren of Andor and his second wife, confirmed the basic facts. Akkor mesélt a nagymamám, hogy hogy mindig úgy nevezett csengő frázba voltak, hogy mikor ki csönget be az ajtón, a vala hírrel, hogy pali valami olyas mit csinált, aminek valami retorziója van. Neki inkább az volt a szerencséje valószínűleg, hogy a az apja képes volt őt a rendőrség kezei közül valahogy kihozni. My father was deeply humiliated that his father pulled strings to get him out of jail. And that's when I finally ran away. I think one of the reasons was that I, I became so notorious that I was afraid to walk on the street because people would point at me. Another reason was that he was a Jew. He and many of his friends had to leave home to study abroad because of an anti-Semitic law in Hungary that barred most Jews from university. It was my cousin Pal who told me we were Jews. És akkor derült ki számomra, hogy te nem tudod, úgyhogy egy kicsit úgy is éreztem magam, hogy valami olyat árulok el neked, ami nem biztos, hogy neked szabadna tudnod, vagy kellene tudnod. Pal showed me documents. And this is the birth certificate of Paul. He was born in 1914, two days before Christmas. And what, what does it say here in this column here? A Paul, boy and Israelite, Jewish. The facts sank in when we went to the Jewish cemetery just outside of Budapest. With us was Pal's son, Tamash, named after me, just as Pal is named after my father, Paul. My father's grandfather, my father's grandmother, his uncle, his aunt, all of them buried in this Jewish cemetery. Here's the name of your grandmother. Uh, she has died in, in 
18 because of the Spanish flu. So she was very young. Yes, 20, 28. And my father was just four years old. Yes. After two years in Czechoslovakia, Andor arranged for Paul to complete his studies at the prestigious Federal Polytechnic School in Zurich. He found a room. It was located above a small cafe. It was there that he met my mother. I remember one time at the bar, I saw this very glamorous looking French woman. She was very tall and slender and she had short dark hair. I immediately fell in love with her. I knew very little French, but I told my friends, see that woman there? This is the woman I'm going to marry. I managed to have somebody introduce me and then it was very immediate. I walked her home and kissed her goodnight. I remember that very well. I was a child grown tall too fast. And everyone could see that I was a brain. I had it easy at school because I absorbed what was taught to me like a sponge. I wanted to become a teacher. I left my hometown and went to Zurich, a crossroads of Europe, where for the first time in my life, I felt as free as a bird. We, we didn't get married because we thought that was sort of a middle class thing which didn't apply to us. But we considered each other as being married. When we met, she was the breadwinner. She had a very good job for the Metal Workers Trade Union. At that time, to have a job was a big deal. You know, I just barely subsisted. But even at that time, I remember my friends were always scared of me because when I had money, I, I immediately spent it and I used to take a taxi. And not really like that and we would go to these fancy places where they would look very suspiciously at us and uh, I would order these things as if I was a millionaire. She used to fall in love with women. And then she wanted me to have them. In Zurich, there was this uh, tall German woman and Madeline was just absolutely in love with her. And she always arranged for me and Lily to be together alone. Cherie, Lily called me today. The feelings that I have in her presence remind me of when I was with Jean-Pierre. The harmony of gestures and movements of people like them have a calming effect on me. So much that I would never feel sad or depressed when I am with them. Can you understand that, darling? I know that feelings like this this kind of admiring of another woman is considered unnatural. Mm -hmm. 
Paul graduated from university with a degree in architecture and engineering. But it was in the midst of the depression and jobs were hard to come by. But he had a connection in the movies. And then all of a sudden, Alexander Korda, the film producer, became very well known at that time in Europe. And my parents said that he must be a relative of yours. So why don't you, if you go to London, he probably is going to give you a job. Because I was, at that time, you know, I mean, it was totally hopeless to find work. By the time Paul arrived in London, there was no job with Corda. It turned out the producer was not a relative after all. And he had just gone bankrupt. London, 22nd of March, 1937. I'm sitting on a bench in Hyde Park, but I can't bring myself to concentrate because of the heat. I have been here a month. Today, when I woke up, I thought that all this is just a dream. It seems improbable how I live without understanding the language and not knowing each day what I ought to be doing. Is it a good dream or a bad dream? Madeleine wrote to him from Zurich, where she had stayed because of her steady job. I am so proud. My little sailor is truly a fabulous sailor. So seaworthy. Beneath his picture in her album, she wrote, Paul Weidlinger, at the helm of my life. My father was not so sure. He made sketches and wrote in his diary. I know a man who never, never went out to sea. He stood in the dirty harbor and wished for infinity. He wished for a little ship that he could steer far, far away. I tried desperately to find a job and to entertain myself. I took a pencil and decided I'm going to fill in all the O's in the phone book. And luckily, as I went, I ran into a name which had many O's in it. It was Moholy, Moholy Knight, the famous painter, and I recognized him as was Hungarian. And I took my last few pennies on the metro and I went out there. He lived in the outskirts of London. And I knocked on his door and he hired me. Dear Illy, I'm starting to hope again. Moholy is so unbelievably kind. I really like working for him, although his studio is a madhouse. It is full of fantastic pictures and models. himself puts his sentences together in three languages, Hungarian, German, and English. And so it is very difficult to understand his complicated thought process. Despite this, I consider him an exceptionally smart person. What is truly unique is he is also honest. Paul was incredibly fortunate. Maholi was a giant of the Bauhaus modernist movement, which introduced ideas in art, craft, design, and architecture that reverberated throughout the 20th century.
The Bauhaus School in Dessau, Germany, was a physical manifestation of the approach. The vision of beauty in simplicity and functionality would have a profound impact on Paul. My parents met for weekends in Paris. My mother came from Zurich, my father from London. They stayed in a cheap hotel in the left bank. Once they went up the Eiffel Tower. From the top, they could see the 1937 World's Fair. The German pavilion was a Nazi icon. As a student of architecture, Paul wrote disparagingly about both it and the Soviet pavilion across the way. In contrast, he was drawn towards a huge tent devoted to modern city planning. It was the creation of the world's greatest living architect, Le Corbusier. Light filters through the canvas walls. The shadows of trees surrounding the tent animate the space. One does not feel cut off from the outside world. Paul believed in its message. Modern architecture, built to the measure of man, could save the world. But the modernist vision was being attacked. The Nazis shut down the Bauhaus school. Over 16,000 works of modern art were confiscated and labeled as degenerate. When Austrians welcomed Hitler's annexation of their country, thousands of Jews tried to escape. England closed her borders against the refugees and deported those already inside the country. We knew that sooner or later they will catch me. And then I had a phone call from the police and they told me I was illegally there and I had 48 hours to leave. But Paul was again lucky. Maholi gave him a letter to Le Corbusier, whose big tent my father had visited at the World's Fair. He said, why don't you go and work for Le Corbusier? It was like somebody telling you to go and work for God. And Le Corbusier was so famous, people who worked there paid to work there. He had this big office and everybody paid him so he, they could work there. But I, because I had this recommendation from Maholi Naj, who was a famous man himself, I was permitted to work for free. And so I moved to Paris. And I made my living by working on the side. I did all kinds of things. I worked at a bakery. I took a job once, an agricultural job, and I was so bad that they fired me in two days. Uh, for a while, I lived on the streets. I didn't have a place to live. Or I, I went and stayed with friends one night here, one night there. During the day, Paul worked as a draftsman in Le Corbusier's atelier. Le Corbusier believed that architecture should be informed by the pure functionality of machines that fulfilled a specific purpose. He famously said, a house is a machine for living in. Paul did not agree. 
If a house were merely a machine, something was missing. He audaciously developed his own theory of modern architecture. Does a boy with little experience dare to write about this topic? Perhaps this soft voice may be heard? Let us build a building with a floor plan that works well. Its colors and proportions are pleasing. Experts do the design and artists are brought in to beautify it. We know it well. We also know that it is not right. The result is simply a concatenation of rooms. There is something missing. What is missing is the creation of space. The creator's form of spatial experience is dense. In architecture, we experience relationships in space. This experience is both active and passive at the same time. We move through space and experience its effect upon us. The only common characteristic in the creations of modern architecture is a highly enhanced level of spatial experience, a joy of space. In November 1938, Nazis torched synagogues, smashed Jewish shops, murdered close to 100 Jewish men, and sent 30,000 to concentration camps. France closed her borders against a second wave of refugees and rounded up illegals just as they had in England after Hitler annexed Austria. Paul was again deported he managed to get a part-time drafting job in Zurich. He moved in with Madeleine and her roommate, but he knew his days were numbered. I existed illegally everywhere, in Switzerland, in France, in, in England. I couldn't go back to Hungary for political reasons. There was really a deep depression, and for me, there was absolutely no place to go. He didn't say he had no place to go because he was a Jew, but he spoke of a way out. And I decided I'm going to take a train to Monte Carlo, and I had this idea that I'm going to go to Monte Carlo and become a millionaire there by gambling. And as I was leaving, the phone rang, and it turned out this cousin of mine was on the phone and he said, why don't you come with me? I'm going to Bolivia. Bolivia was one of the few countries granting visas to Jews in 1939. Cousin Bandi got visas for himself, Paul, and two other Jewish engineers they'd gone to school with. Paul went to see Madeleine and told her he was going and that she should follow him. My father's ship was filled with refugees bound for the Panama Canal and beyond. The four friends kept a common journal of their crossing. Paul added the cartoons. The whole thing started out leaving the troubled waters of Europe for the calm sea in a small ship. Birchup 
was happy to discover a piano in the lounge and started to caress the poor thing in his usual tender way. The notion of seasickness did not even occur to us, since our friend Janusz assures us that he has a full bottle of oil which can tame the biggest waves. The fact is, after I threw up everything, it became easier, but I had to stay horizontal. So I stayed like this, except for having an argument with the ship's doctor, who stated that an English gentleman does not vomit even when he is seasick. A young Austrian Jew crossing the Atlantic at the same time and on the same route wrote, This is a transport of displaced and vanquished people. Our ship is populated with fugitives from every corner of greater Germany. Here are people whose pianos have been thrown out of the window into the street on Kristallnacht. Here are Jews from Galatian shtetls, impoverished Austrian aristocrats still trying to cling desperately to a little bit of distinction, and folk from widely dispersed places who had become intimately acquainted with unclean jails and the pitiless immigration police of every nation. Even though the four were Jewish in their origins, their jokes, and their gestures, they kept separate from the other passengers. They did not think of themselves as refugees. Meanwhile, Madeleine, from a Catholic family in neutral Switzerland, had no need to flee Europe, but she chose to follow her lover. 8 March 1939 Dearest, I want to write you again how much I love you. I will not let anything keep me from being with you soon forever. I am saying my goodbyes to our friends in Zurich and to my family. I am leaving on April 8th from La Rochelle on the Reina del Pacifico. Her beloved Leica camera was her constant companion. The world she photographed was entirely new to her. In Havana Harbor, she saw people with brown skin for the first time. While her ship passed through the Panama Canal, she went ashore and saw places that Paul and his friends had visited three weeks before. The ship's final port of call was Arica, Chile. There, she made a portrait of a woman who, like her, was waiting for the train to the interior. Dearest, I am already here now. I received your letters in Havana and Panama. They were like lighthouses that greeted me along the way. Now, I have only one wish, to be in your arms. Just a few more days, and that will come true. On Monday, there's a train, though without sleeping berths. But I cannot wait another week for the next train. Such a long time without you does not work for me. I wanted to see more of what my mother saw from this train. But the train stopped running long ago, and tracing its route was not easy. Traveling across the world's highest desert, I finally came to the frontier outpost of Chiranya. Thousands of Jewish refugees came through here in 1939 and 1940 including my parents. 
A German Jewish refugee who rode the train wrote, We did not expect the altitude to be so oppressive. On the train, people's noses and ears were bleeding. And the Indians? We never had seen anything like them. At stops, we looked at them, and they looked at us. Paul and Madeleine's final destination was La Paz, the highest big city in the world. They got married there, despite Paul's disdain for marriage as a middle-class thing. Soon, he got a job with the only outfit building modern urban structures in Bolivia. And I started working as a draftsman. After a few months' work, I was kept on promoting. I finally was heading up this whole huge office. We had a labor force of 2,000 people. And I designed the buildings, I designed everything. And I had a great fun doing it. How is this possible? I asked a Bolivian historian of architecture. Para el año 36, en Bolivia no había experiencia de trabajar con hormigón armado. Paul Weinger llega el año 39, que es un hombre que tiene experiencia de haber trabajado con hormigón. Pero paralelamente, en la ciudad de La Paz se abre una avenida nueva y se hace una apertura nueva en esta avenida que les permite a los jóvenes arquitectos construir edificios de corte moderno. And all over the city, the adobes are coming down, and new, starkly modern buildings of reinforced concrete and brick are going up. This reconstruction is a hard job. There is no easy access to building material. There is little wood, and all iron and steel must be imported. They were in so much need of, of people, of technical skills, that when they heard you were an engineer, we assumed you were a god. Paul's bosses gave him an apartment on the top floor of their building. It was in one of La Paz's most exclusive neighborhoods. 75 years later, it is a derelict hulk. But I am determined to get inside and stand in the rooms where my parents made their first home. It was a lovely big apartment and the beautiful big windows. Paul made drawings of the bedroom and the living room. New possessions are carefully labeled. I think he is boasting. After years of being a student without a country, he is saying, look, we have arrived. He is only 25. Financially and economically, it was like heaven. So we became incredibly rich, practically overnight. There was a gambling casino there. You know, gambling and losing $2,000 a night. And uh, your mother became very unhappy with it, and she talked to me about it, and she said that this is immoral, what I was doing. I had no standards. I had no... I didn't know what one does. I very much relied on her, what was good or bad. They were drifting apart. Though they went on excursions with Hungarian friends to the hot springs of Umiri, Lake Titicaca, and Sarata, 
Madeleine never felt a part of the group. She preferred to explore on her own with her camera. Through its lens, she saw people that were simply invisible to most Europeans. My dear little sailor, as soon as we left the ground, the people on the earth looked like nothing more than little commas. We flew above the barren altiplano. Madeleine often traveled alone to spend time in a retreat near Cochabamba at a lower, more breathable altitude. Three months pregnant in March 1940, she was convinced she would bear Paul a son. I dream almost every night about you. Last night, it was horrible. I felt a sense of foreboding and could not fall asleep again. I made mittens for Jack. I will send them to you so you will have nice thoughts about our child. I feel as if I had to discuss many things with you, but I don't actually know what. I remember the day she was born in, in La Paz. I don't know why we assumed that it's going to be a boy. Uh, when Michelle was born, Madeleine said, where is my boy? And then the doctor said, your boy is a girl. It was, it was just nothing but joy. Two weeks after my sister was born, the German bombing of London started and lasted for eight months. Across Europe, the war was going badly for the Allies. In Hungary, an anti-Semitic law barred my grandparents from earning a living. They wrote to my parents asking for help to escape. Dear Madeleine and Pal, we are all right, of course, but in need of help. Our greatest ambition now is to reach you as soon as possible. Because for Father and Lulu, it is not at all worthwhile to begin a work here. But Paul was powerless to help. He'd been trying to get an immigration visa to the United States ever since Hitler annexed Austria. Two more years would pass until he succeeded. Yeah. I think I shall like the States much more than I did Bolivia. They seem to like me in the office. They are giving me $24 a week. Michelle is crazy about going to school, and she already speaks very good English. They were welcomed by distant relatives in Chicago. Madeleine got a job in the photo darkroom at Montgomery Ward's while well, Paul went to look for work in New York. I wish to come to you soon, even if I'm scared about air raid and being alone if you go into the army. I am glad you had a nice time looking at the George Washington Bridge. I am sure you could build something like that. Very soon. We will all three go together and have a look at it, if it is not bombed yet. Paul was obsessed with getting into the fight. 
In London, places he had known during his time with Maholi were reduced to rubble. I wanted to be in that, and I didn't want it to happen without me. I mean, I had the feeling that I could make a difference. He conceived of a weapon that could defend a city, an anti-aircraft gun guided by the beam of a searchlight. He offered his invention to the U.S. War Department. I found his carbon copy of the description. The projectile has the property of remaining always inside of the cylinder formed by the beam of the searchlight. Photoelectric controller organs in connection with small loadings of explosive gas keep the projectile within the searchlight's beam. He had no response to his letter. For a long time, my father did not know if his family in Hungary survived. Finally, almost a year after the liberation of Budapest, a letter arrived from my grandfather. It is impossible to speak about what we have been going through. We had to move into a Yellow Star house. At the end of April, Lulu was taken away to an internment camp. With great effort, we saved her from being deported. amelyet anyám ebből a toloncházból írt a szüleinek. Ugye mindegyikben csak annyit szabadott megírni, hogy jól vagyok és megvagyok, de mindegyik más címre volt címezve. Tehát egyik sem a, a szülők. In October, we hid in Buda with false papers. We lived on Pasaréti utca, in a hole in the ground. When liberation came, we were in the basement between dead bodies and rubble. Our abandoned home was hit by a bomb. Everything that wasn't destroyed was looted. From the family we have lost. Pista Wendlinger, Illis' husband, Ferenc Pandi, Lajos and Berta Sarvas, and their son. Only Ilana survived. Pista Plager died along with Monsi and Auntie Kato during the bombing of the ghetto. We are in great need, mostly lacking food. My son, please tell me honestly if you can help us. Please tell us as soon as possible we wait for your letter. Paul was powerless to help until he became a U.S. citizen in 1948, but by then it was too late. My family were trapped behind the Iron Curtain. I wish he had told me everything. Why had he kept secrets? Hungry for clues, I searched everywhere for the boy and the man who was Paul Weidlinger. The skating rink he went to as a child. his elementary school and high school, where he was rebellious and his grades were poor. I went up to the lookout on St. John's Mountain, where Ely and Paul used to go, and I visited the apartment building he grew up in. 
I talked with the five women who were the daughters of his Jewish classmates, exiled in Czechoslovakia. I asked my cousins to tell me what they thought, but we could only guess at Paul's reasons for his secrecy. Finally, I came to the place on the edge of the Danube that my grandparents had barely escaped. Here, Jews were stripped of their shoes and their clothes, lined up and executed, shot into the river. My father knew this and all that happened to our family. Now, knowing what he knew, I felt close to him. I wish I could say this to him. If we do not want to die together in war, we must learn to live together in peace. In 1945, there were two events of great significance to me, the atom bomb and the signing of the United Nations Charter, which I believe is our best hope for world peace. Paul is having endless discussions with his friends about the science of the bomb and the possible disintegration of all matter in a nuclear chain reaction. But what does this have to do with making peace? Michelle, our daughter, is as scared as I am. The atomic test program of the Federal Civil Defense Administration as seen by June Cowan, reporter. Here at the Nevada test site, I covered a program to test the effects of an atomic blast upon the things we use in our everyday lives. I was especially interested in the food test program. As a mother and housewife, this appealed to me. Would food in the average home be safe to eat after a blast? H minus 10 seconds. Nine. Eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Now I wonder if the atomic age is not bringing upon us a disintegration of human empathy. Maybe with a little less intelligence and a little more heart, we could have been happy. But I know now it is impossible. Happiness is made from two people living in harmony. When I asked for a separation, I was still hesitating, saying to myself, it is not possible. He will take me in his arms saying, it was just a bad dream. You said I did not do a thing to you. Don't you see that this is exactly a sign of indifference that I cannot accept? Please, let us separate right away. Because seeing you every day, feeling the indifference in your voice, all this takes my force away. And I know that I will need all my strength for what is coming. That is the time when her eye began to recede. The worst of it was the double vision which she developed. This is where I first learned the expression, the term psychosomatic. And, and then it, it, it got worse and worse. Michelle is worried as I become ill. 
my eyes. That's when her mental illness came out. And finally one night she ran out of the house in the middle of the night. There was a movie of Hamlet. She went to see that movie. I say we will have no more marriages. And she came home and she was utterly confused. God be with you. She somehow wasn't sure whether she was part of the movie or not. And finally she quieted down and I fell asleep. And when I woke up, she was gone. She ran out the street without her clothes. All the doctors agreed on a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Hallucinations, depression, fear, delusions of persecution, and a false belief of superiority were the symptoms. The Institute of Living was progressive for its time. In its brochure, it looked more like a country club than an asylum. It offered hydrotherapy, light therapy, wet wraps, and steam baths. Not included in the brochure were the more controversial insulin shock and electric shock treatments my mother received. It was the most horrible experience, for I did not want to be there. It was totally against my will. And I discovered the fee for every day she stayed there was about what I made it in a week. And I remember I went to see this psychiatrist, the doctor who advised me, and I said, what am I going to do now? How am I going to pay this? And he looked at me and he said, don't give me that bullshit. You can make all the money you want to. You're an engineer, you can work, start your own office, do whatever you want. Make the money. I'm not worried about it. And, and that, that made all the difference. And this is why I started my own office. In an era before computers, his tools were a slide rule, a blackboard, and an electric mechanical calculator called a Frieden machine. No longer designing buildings as he did in Bolivia, he worked with modernist architects to translate their ideas into structurally sound designs. When I started in the firm, there were four people. When I left the firm, there were 300. He had one problem. He had, he had a personal problem dealing with people. So his relationship with architects at the beginning was quite difficult. Either he didn't like their work and then he sloughed them off, or he simply didn't have the patience to deal with them. The clients he did get along with were modernists. Gordon Bunshaft designed buildings that derived their beauty from structural solutions rather than surface ornamentation. The two of them somehow got along famously. I mean, they just had a uh, perfect rapport. The Bank Lambert in Brussels was the first building they did together. Paul had the idea of using hundreds of stainless steel hinges to connect precast concrete crosses that formed the facade. It was unlike anything that had been done before. Madeleine remained at the Institute of Living for half a year. She seemed cured when she was released. She wrote in her album, Michel has suffered much from that separation, but was kept in good shape because of the care of Clara, who was her constant companion during my absence. Michel made drawings of the perfect happy family that she yearned to have.
In the summer of 1952, Paul, Madeleine, and Michelle embarked on a grand European vacation. In London, where my father had struggled to eke out a living just one step ahead of immigration authorities, he booked rooms at the Park Lane with a view of Buckingham Palace. In Paris, they went again to the Eiffel Tower. So much had changed. They had survived the war, prospered, and brought Michelle into the world. She kept a meticulous diary. We went down the Boulevard Saint-Michel, after which I was named. There we sat at the Café Capulade. Then we went to the Luxembourg Gardens. We saw children sailing toy boats on the lake. In the afternoon, I went with Mommy and Daddy to Versailles, which was the palace of the Kings of France. The gardens are very beautiful. But not everything was as picture perfect as her diary made it seem. There always seemed to be a lot of tension between Michelle's father and mother. She seemed to always be trying to control everything, and he always seemed to be slipping out from her control. And Michelle seemed very intimidated by your mother. Anxiety, not being able to please her, your mother would be very short with her. She would be reduced to tears by things your mother would say to her. The next day, we went to the Cathedral of Notre Dame. It was very quiet and dark. But Michelle did not produce her diary alone. The words are hers, but they are edited and typed by Madeleine, who also required my sister to copy from the encyclopedia descriptions of every country they visited. Your mother needed huge order because of internal chaos. And your mother had a lot of external order, which may have helped to contain the chaos. Your father was more like a bird or a bee, uh, never quite fitting in the cage. <laughs> in many ways, he was a loving parent, but I wouldn't think of him as necessarily a highly responsible parent. He was always seeking to be free. Halfway through the summer, Paul returned to work. Dear little Michi, I enjoy all of your letters and your drawings. Send me a lot more. Whenever I see a little girl in the street, I ask myself, what is my little sweetheart doing right now? Does she behave when she's with her mommy? When you were born, it was a different thing for me because it was a signal that from heaven that everything was wonderful. Summers were spent in the house my father built. He just came on the weekends to visit us. The earliest memory I have is of lying next to him in a hammock. We were together, but separate. Sometimes we went to the beach. I was just completely crazy about you. I always had to restrain myself, or that I shouldn't show it.
He also liked to make sand people. I imagined them coming alive. Then he made me a sand person. It felt weird, like I was his creation. Uh, Madeleine came to me and she said, you have to be careful. You are so crazy about him that uh, Michelle is going to get jealous if she sees that. Uh, I remember I used to be critical. She did something wrong, I would think it was wrong. But I, I was very uncritical with you. When summer was over and we were back in our apartment in the city, I often had nightmares. My father would come into my room and sing to me. When I was a bachelor, I lived all alone. I worked at the fever straight. And the only, only thing that I did that was wrong was to woo a fair young maid. Again, I'm a bachelor. I live with my son. We work at the fever stray. And every single time that I look into his eyes, he reminds me of that fair young maid. When I was older, my mother took me to art museums. Of all the pictures we looked at, one stayed fixed in my mind. Francisco Goya's The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. Maybe this is why I was afraid to sleep, to dream. With us, it seemed that reason had gone to sleep, to be replaced by madness. One day, I stayed home from school. My mother made lunch. She was very angry because I had not brushed my hair. And she said that men in the grocery store were spying on her. We had to watch our step. Could I not see this? She seemed more like an animal than a person. In my imagination, I try to comfort my younger self. There is only one time when all four of us appear in the same photographs together. I was eight. A few months later, my parents divorced, and I was sent to boarding school. I hated that Paul gave Madeleine the custody of me. I had to spend summer vacations with her. My cat and I hid under the house when she was very angry. Or I climbed this tree. There were more branches 60 years ago. I felt the safest when I could go out onto the lake with my boat.
Sometimes my mother made me go down into the well to prime the pump. It was scary, and there were spiders. One time she put the cover on, trapping the plumber inside. Word got around and tradesmen refused to come. Soon she was without water and gas for cooking and heating. It seemed to me that this had to do with the sleeping man. He was like my father. Paul was in his 80s when I finally asked him why he'd left me with Madeleine. And one day she just announced she wanted to divorce and, and uh, before I knew she was gone. She got a lawyer and I remember I was so upset about it, I didn't even want to have a lawyer. She, she insisted that you live with her. And uh, the, the fact that she was taking care of you was very important for her. I, I had a, you know, I always had a feeling about you that you were a, a completely self-sufficient, reliable person. And I said, everything is going to be OK, because I couldn't live with it if it wasn't. It's a little naive. Isn't it? Of course it is naive, yeah, it is. But it's not something which you figure out rationally. I wanted him to say, I'm very sorry for leaving you with your crazy mother. But he never did. Il était un petit navire, il était un petit navire qui n'avait ja, ja, jamais navigué, qui n'avait ja, ja, jamais navigué. Oé, oé. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? In school, we were trained how to duck and cover in case of a nuclear attack. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. When I visited my father, he tried to reassure me by explaining nuclear detente. The Russians would never be foolish enough to attack us. This was based on the Russians knowing we had enough bombs to completely destroy them, even if they attacked first. Of course, we would be wiped out too. This was called the theory of mutually assured destruction, or MAD for short. This was confusing. My mother's name was Madeleine. She signed her letters mad. I knew that she was crazy mad. Mad was mutually assured destruction. This meant we might all go crazy and be destroyed. I did not know that MAD was the basis for work that my father was doing. The RAND Corporation, the Air Force think tank, asked Paul Weidlinger if he could engineer hardened silos to protect our nuclear missiles from a preemptive strike. Paul loved working for RAND, where the country's most brilliant minds were recruited to develop nuclear war strategy. They had all these geniuses around, and uh, probably one of the closest friends I acquired was Herman Kahn, a physicist there, who I always thought was the uh, brightest person I ever met. He had a great influence on me. I remember that Kahn came to our apartment before the divorce. I worried that he would break our furniture. He spoke fast like a stand-up comic. Quoted in Life magazine, he said, I am big, fat, and lousy Jewish, and they take it. They take it because they know I'm worried about the country. I was scared of him, 
but I could not have said why. A moment, please, Mr. President. In the movie, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, the title character was inspired by Khan. Yeah, a study of this project by the Blend Corporation. He describes a doomsday machine programmed to destroy the Earth if anyone launched a nuclear attack. It was the ultimate deterrent. Deterrence is the art of producing in the mind of the enemy the fear to attack. The doomsday machine was one of the many scenarios in Khan's famous book, on thermonuclear war. He wrote to my father on the flyleaf, if you have any suggestions, send them. I hope to have a new printing soon. Some people considered Khan to be a moral monster. If my father was friends with him, did that make him a moral monster too? Paul was simply fascinated by the science. You know, that's what really intrigued him, the challenge of trying to develop something that would survive such a horrendous explosion. Once I realized the magnitude of the threat and how much pressure was going to be on our structure, I realized that if that really ever happened, there wouldn't be any people left. So, like, what am I doing this for? Paul was in my office, and I had a blackboard on the wall, and he wrote, in big letters, he just wrote, detente. Hi there, good morning. Good morning. Some of the men and women Paul hired during the Cold War still worked at the company he founded. I learned that their boss was a different person from the doting yet distant father I knew as a young boy. I was always scared of him, actually. He was very, uh, he was intimidating. When I would be summoned, when I received the call that uh, Mr. Weiling wanted to speak with me, I, it was always this very, you know, lonely walk across, down the aisle, around the receptionist area to see uh, Mr. Weidlinger. If I did something wrong, I knew immediately, in no uncertain terms, that I had screwed up. And uh, he wasn't so polite about it either. He was very um, obnoxious. I was reminded that it was absolutely impossible to win an argument with him. Your father was very sophisticated, very subtle. And um, he could come up with 15 ways to get around whatever your argument was. But I. I didn't feel that he was the kind of person that I would bear my soul to. But there was also a, a certain undercurrent of fear. People feared crossing Paul. In addition to structural and civil engineering, the firm had done top secret work for the military for half a century. In 2014, Ray D'Addazio was the CEO of the company. We sat at the table that my father had used as his desk. Paul became more interested in um, the MX missile project to design missile silos so that um, when, the, when the Soviets were attacking us, we would still be able to launch our missiles back at them. It's an interesting problem for sure, one that nobody had worked on before, and I think that that's what really intrigued him. I remember one of the analysts from the Applied Science Group running into his office saying, you know, Paul, Paul, we just got the analysis back and, uh, you know, I can tell you that your design is going to work. And his response was, I knew that my silo was going to work, but now I know that your program is going to work. Come, you masters of war. As a teenager, I played Bob Dylan's song, Masters of War, over and over and over. It was about him and me. And I 
stand over your grave till I'm sure that you're dead. I talked with a man who had been at Rand with Herman Kahn and my father. In retrospect, what was their contribution to detente? So Rand, your father and I, had been working night and day with very great concern and obsession on a problem that didn't exist. The Russians did not have a first strike force at all. So for us to maintain silo-based ICBMs has been based on the idea of preemption and of limiting damage to ourselves in a nuclear war. That idea has been a hoax and a fraud since, at the, at the latest, 1965. It has been nothing other than uh, hurting our security to have in existence these land-based missiles, which invite attack by the other side in case of a false alarm. In fact, your father made no contribution to the security of the United States, nor did anyone at RAND, including myself. So I see myself now as having been the member of a cult, an apocalyptic cult, Herman being the guru. My father worked on missile silos until the early 1980s. His last and most ambitious proposal was for a silo to house the world's most destructive nuclear weapon, the MX Peacekeeper missile. I really wanted to see one of my father's super silos. MX missiles were decommissioned in 2004, but the silos that housed them were still on the ground near Cheyenne, Wyoming. I was expecting something really dramatic, but this is all that I found. It turns out his super silos were never built. In the 1980s, Congress cut back on funding for nuclear arms. The world's deadliest weapons were housed in old silos entirely vulnerable to Soviet attack. After the divorce, Paul remarried. Solveig was everything Madeleine wasn't. Sane, stable, and pragmatic. I stayed angry at him. When I visited his home, I posed reluctantly with my new sister and brother. But what of my other sister, whom I loved? My first sister, Michelle. When I was very little, she would take care of me. Once, she took me on an adventure down the creek. She convinced me that there were crocodiles lurking beneath the lily pads. There was this photo on my father's desk uh, when I was young, and then that photo disappeared. But then many years later, I, I found it, and I went and asked, my mother at that point about who this was and she said it was your sister Michelle and and, and I was like my who my sister and, and you know and she told me the whole story and uh, to me that seemed like like it was the first time I'd ever heard of her charismatic searching yearning conflicted a wonderful friend I'm going to need a Kleenex. <laughs> she felt replaced by, by having a younger brother because your dad, her father, was thrilled at finally having a son. And she felt very, very much that he didn't approve of her. When she finished college, she took a bus west to Oregon 
where she found a job as a teacher. Dear, dear, dearest daddy, I feel saner now than I have ever felt, and certainly more at peace than you or mom have been in a long time. I am a natural born teacher. I love teaching French. My students are great. The faculty treat me with a respect that I don't quite know what to do with. I went to a teach-in on Vietnam and an ecumenical conference with religious leaders, from priests to swamis. I'm gathering my energy to get back to where my heart belongs, in the exciting rush and vitality of reform and causes. The most vital life is the life that is going on inside me. Two guys are bugging me about marriage. Daddy, Daddy, I wish we knew each other better as human beings. Love and kisses, Michelle. Men were attracted to her, but I don't think she ever saw herself as being in a long-term relationship. And I think that's why she didn't tell Julian's father early on. She'd gotten pregnant when she had an affair with a man named Paul Golightly. Would it surprise you to know that my father tried to persuade her to get an abortion? Not at all. Being a single mother was not accepted at that time. He would see that as a reflection upon him. As a result, he just would want that to go away. There is another unspoken reason why he begged her to terminate her pregnancy. This is the first time in my life that I've heard you plead with me that you appear utterly convinced that my decision is a wrong one. You allude to deep-seated psychological difficulties of which I am unaware and which are better left unclarified? How can you be so certain of irrevocable destruction? Paul could not answer. How could he tell her that he was afraid that she would go crazy like her mother? He, too, was gripped with the fear of mutual assured destruction. My nephew, Julian, was born in March 1966. Michelle didn't marry his father. Forty-five years later, I wanted to talk to him. I made him an album of pictures of my sister and his son. She was just uh, totally different from any other woman I had met at that time. And uh, we were like soulmates. I just felt so comfortable around her. Later, she uh, told me that she was pregnant. So if that's what she says, that's the way it is, and I'm going to take responsibility, you know. But she never wanted me to do anything except give Julian my name and then I visited her for Christmas. I just remember that that was a real happy time, you know, and I was, I was so happy that I had a son, you know. I went to live with Michelle and Julian when I graduated from high school. Something felt wrong, but I didn't know what it was. She started having visions, you know. And one of her visions was that she was Mary and that Julian was Jesus. And I think at some point I told her I didn't want to hear that shit, you know, because it was getting more and more out there. And then the next time I saw was when she came to New York. That was the last time. Your father called and he said, have you seen? Michelle or Julian, I said, no, I thought that she was with you. He said, no, no, she said she was going to be with you. She called him and apparently, and I gather this, told him that she was going to do this. And, and uh, that she was going to kill the baby and herself. And he frantically, he was at the office. 
I, and, and he closed the door, frantically was calling around to find out where she was. And about um, 12 hours later, he called and he said, Paul, they have found Michelle and Julian and they're both dead. Then he asked me would I go and identify the boss. I said, sure I would, you know. Why did he ask you that? Because I guess it was too emotional for him to do it himself. Do you remember when my sister died? Very well. What I remember is the news or the post had it on the front page. And I came to work, and how do we offer condolences? And Dad came in with the dark glasses that day, and uh, he never mentioned it. And eventually, no one said anything. I mean, he was a, he was a broken man, absolutely. I, I felt, uh, you know, I felt uh, very much that I, I, was, I was responsible for that. I, I never managed to show her how much I loved her. Jonathan and I had never been to Michelle and Julian's grave. My father had not wanted me there the day they were buried. If he were still alive, there is one question I would ask him. Why are their full names not here? Michelle Weidlinger, Julian Luke Golightly. Madeleine was convinced that Michelle and Julian had been murdered, made to take sleeping pills by the same shadowy people who were forever spying on her. She died in a hostel for indigent people in 1976. When I turned the age my sister was when she died, I felt I did not deserve to outlive her. I thought about suicide then, just as I did recently, when I began to write about this part of our lives. I went on a journey to visit the buildings and monumental sculptures that are my father's legacy. Filming them, standing in front of them, walking around them, I felt closer to him than I had since I was a child. Engineers are the ones who keep buildings from falling down. They create the strength behind the beauty. Paul loved a challenge. If someone said it couldn't be done, he would find a way to do it. The original engineer who did this church by Marcel Breuer made a mistake in his calculations and the concrete roof was in danger of collapsing. Paul and Mattis figured out a way to save it. They went on to work with Breuer on another church and the Whitney Museum in New York. They did Gyo Obata's church. Nothing like it had ever been done before.
The city of Chicago needed an engineer to make sure that Picasso's sculpture could withstand the strongest winds. Paul Weidlinger was their man. Paul consulted on Isamo Noguchi's spaceship fountain and befriended the artist whose vision mirrored his own joy of space. Paul then worked on his 10-story bolt of lightning. Noguchi kept changing his design, making it more and more impossible to engineer. Paul loved the French artist Jean de Buffet. He worked for free on the artist's Villa Falbala, a landscape and structure that defies definition. What is it for? One cannot get a clear answer. The artist himself spoke in riddles, which I think is what endeared him to my father. We must realize that the things we take for real are nothing more than an arbitrary interpretation of things. In the end, I came back to the house my father built the year I was born. Here, he was both architect and engineer. For my help with restoring it, I was rewarded a month-long stay. Sharon came with me. Here, Paul's idea of the joy of space is perfectly manifest. Here, I also wrote the final words of the restless Hungarian book. I believe there is a purpose in descending into the depths of the past and befriending the sorrowful souls who still dwell there in our hearts. I have done this with Andor, Yulia, Lulu, Ili, Paul, Madeleine, Michelle and Julian, and younger versions of myself. Hoping not only to make them completely real in my heart, but perhaps reaching through the veil of time and space to let them know that they are truly seen, honored and loved. I say to them, look, dear family, I am well, I am alive, and I embrace you. Il était un petit navire, il était un petit navire qui n'avait ja, ja, jamais navigué, qui n'avait ja, ja, jamais navigué. Oé, 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 matelot, matelot navigue sur les flots. Oé, oé, matelot, matelot navigue sur les flots.